Welcome to Owl Have You Know, a podcast from Rice Business. This episode is part of our Up Next series, where faculty, researchers, and alumni weigh in on the trends currently shaping the world of business. Welcome to Owl Have You Know, a podcast from Rice Business. This episode is part of our Up Next series, where guests weigh in on the trends currently shaping the world of business. I'm your host, Scott Gale, and today I'm speaking with two leadership experts. Ruth Reitmeyer, Director of Coaching at Rice Business, and Brent Smith, the Senior Associate Dean for Executive Education and Associate Professor of Management and Psychology. Certain topics like cryptocurrency, AI, political polarization, and Jennifer Coolidge's comeback speak to the cultural zeitgeist. They characterize moments in time. But the topic of leadership and what it takes to be an impactful leader is endlessly relevant and fascinating. We all have the potential to be trailblazers in our lives and careers. Even if you aren't a CEO or on your way to becoming one, everyone leads from where they are. Life demands it of us. Leadership isn't a title or position. It's an identity that's forged over time. So I'm excited to have both Ruth and Brent here joining us for an in-depth discussion on what it takes to be a strong leader today, common pitfalls in leadership development, and how Rice Business creates transformational leaders. So let's just dive right in, Ruth and Brent. For those in the audience that haven't benefited from your expertise yet, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves, your roles at Rice Business, and how you became interested in leadership coaching? Ruth, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Ruth Reitmeyer, uh, formerly Ruth O. when I was an undergrad here at Rice. Um, I graduated in the early 90s, met my husband here at Rice, um, raised my kids here in Houston. I've got three grown kids, and um, I got interested in leadership coaching um, because it seemed to be the right intersection for my skills and my interests and my experiences. People who know me well will say that I'm kind of that blend of like radical candor. Like my husband will say, you don't pull punches, but people also will say like, you care deeply about people. And because you care about them and love them, you know, you can deliver those hard truths. And those are qualities that you need um, to be an executive coach. You need to have backbone, you need to have heart. And um, my role here at Rice Business is to build bespoke coaching programs for the students. Um, We want you to graduate here feeling like you've been developed as leaders, and we want to bring some evidence-based practices to how we develop you as leaders. And coaching is one of those evidence-based practices. We know that it's effective. We know that it helps build your leader identity. And we know that that personalized approach can really help unlock your potential as leaders. Hi, I'm Brent Smith. Um, I've been a professor at Rice since 2001. Most of the time, I stepped away for a little while. Prior to Rice, I was a professor at Cornell uh, in upstate New York. And I've been at London Business School for a short period of time in the, in, in the interim for a while as well. Uh, my PhD is in psychology, so I got interested in leadership and leadership developments, you know, all the way back to the early days of my PhD program when I was studying leadership and kind of thinking about some of the psychological mechanisms that affect people's ability to make transitions in leadership roles, particularly leadership roles of greater and greater levels of responsibility. So that was, that was kind of my, I guess, the font of my initial interest you know, in development. When I got my first job at Cornell, uh, I was completely unprepared for the task, but the dean of the Johnson School at Cornell asked myself and a good friend and colleague, Randall Peterson, if we would build uh, a leadership development program for the MBAs. And we sat there and we thought about it, and we realized that we had no idea how to approach that or you know, how to really think about the challenge of that. You know, We had read all the research around leadership, but we we really hadn't thought through the process of taking people who were in an MBA program and getting them to think about an MBA program not as a collection of classes, but as a, as a full leader development experience. And we built, uh, you know, partially in concert with some other, some other folks who were giving us good guidance, we built um, kind of the first coaching program for Cornell's, uh, Corn- uh, the Johnson School's MBA program. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it, it kind of started to take off a little bit. Uh, and I think slowly and very iteratively over the course of a few years, we started to build it into something that, you know, 
taught me about leadership development, you know, as I was getting more and more interested in the science of it. So that was, that was really the, the font of my interest in leadership development and I guess my practical experience. When I moved from Cornell to Rice, I think we put in the first proposal for a leadership coaching program for the Jones School in around 2005 or 2006. Uh, we weren't quite ready, I think, as a school to be able to consume that kind of program. So it took a little bit longer to get it in place, but I think around eight or nine or ten, uh, we implemented a coaching program in the EMBA program that really looked very similar to what they've done at Cornell. So one of the goals here kind of is to demystify leadership a little bit. And so I want to just sort of cannonball in and kind of ask the question, like, as you've kind of on ramps to this journey and as you're kind of traveling down this, this highway, what have you changed your mind about leadership along the way? Some orthodoxy or some approach or process? I don't know if I would say that this is changing my mind. I would say that what has been reaffirmed consistently over time about leadership is that the belief that there might be some kind of magic bullet you know, that, that really can solve the problem of leadership is, is just, it's, it's kind of unrealistic. Uh, I think those who have been in my class probably have heard, my, heard me you know, belabor the point that leadership is something that is just unfortunately quite contextual. Uh, and without an understanding of context, it's really difficult to understand leadership. Right? You know, if you're a frontline supervisor, you know, leadership means one thing. If you're a COO, leadership might mean something entirely different. If you're in a company with a highly innovative culture, leadership might be something. If you're in a company that's high reliability, it might be something entirely different. So I guess if I've become more clear about something, it's that leaders need to be very thoughtful about the context that they're in and let that be kind of the guide to what kind of leader they should be, rather than trying to look for a magic answer that might be out there in some, some book. So can I share an unpo unpopular opinion? Please. Um, I think that most leader development as we know it is very elitist, individualistic, and not effective. I think that it's, you know, it's a $366 billion industry worldwide. But why do we have such a leadership shortage? Like, why is everybody's leadership pipeline so anemic? And so there's something that's broken in the world of leader development. And I think that, you know, being in a room full of people that are attached to Rice University, I think you know that there are bogus leader development things out there. And then there's evidence-based leader development. So I think that what I would say... I'm really passionate about and what I've come to like really want to um, push back against is the kind of the myth of leader development and sending people away on corporate retreats and they're going to come back magically transformed. It's just a very slow, iterative <laughs> process. And um, I just think, you know, people don't realize it's like going to the gym. You know, one of my mentors, uh, David Day, says leader development is a gym membership. It's getting up and going to the gym every day and working those muscles. And that's not very sexy or appealing to most people. Hmm. I love this. I kind of want to hang out here for, for another second and just to, to triangulate a bit more and just sort of ask a, a bit more of a direct question too, to just kind of layer on is just kind of what are some of the words you use to define, let's just say good leadership. Um, and you can reject sort of the question and reframe it as well, because context matters, uh, all of these things. But sort of, I think that there's uh, certainly interest in, in sort of the, those that are listening of kind of like, what are some of the characteristics that you have found in your experience that good leaders have? I, I think we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the unified theory of leadership is. And it, 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 all, all, all you have to do is to go into Google and search, you know, what are the traits of effective leaders or what are the characteristics of successful leaders? And you will find a thousand pages of information telling you that this is what it is, right? This is the holy grail. Uh, and that, that, the, the research that's been done on leadership kind of basically belies that simple finding, right? And what's fascinating, honestly, if you're an academic, is that academics can look at this problem and just monumentally disagree about it. Yeah, because we can look at something that is, a, that is a study that shows that a particular characteristic explains a certain percentage of variance in effectiveness and leadership and say, wow, look at that. 
but it's still explaining only that much variance in leadership. And the huge amounts are explained by other things because people are in different contexts. And I get, I mean, what, I, what, what frustrates me, I think, about trying to identify universals or suggesting to people that there are is that it can be extraordinarily misleading, right? Uh, particularly when the concepts that we talk about themselves are somewhat ambiguous and open to interpretation. Right? I would love for people to think that the, the, the tools to leadership are right in front of them, right? But they have to understand what's right in front of them. You know, what's the culture in which I'm embedded? What are the expectations that my boss has of me? What are the capabilities that drive success for my team? What do my employees actually need from me as a leader? And start to build this kind of rich understanding of what's right in front of them that's giving them great information about the kind of leader they need to be at that moment. So the problem is, and I think this will probably get to my slight non-answer to your question, um, the problem is that that context changes constantly. And I think any leader who's in a complex organization dealing with really challenging issues will tell you that sometimes that context differs 10 times in a single day. Where I'm dealing with, you know, an analyst community at 10 a.m., but, you know, at 2 o'clock I'm dealing with an unhappy, you know, you know, customer. And at 4 I'm dealing with an employee who needs a little bit of coaching or something along those lines. They're all different contexts that require different behavior for me to be able to succeed. So I, I was talking about this in a program that I was teaching yesterday and today. Um, I had about 20 physician executives you know, in a classroom. And someone very thoughtfully heard me talk about that and said, so what you're saying is that it's all about adaptability then. I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, maybe that's important. Right? You know, a willingness to be somewhat adaptable you know, and let the situation kind of be, to a certain extent, your guide. Ruth, any thoughts on that? I mean, I, we're, we're wandering down a path that uh, is somewhat deliberately to sort of start to chip away at effective leadership and what that means and looks like. Sure. Um, I mean, I would agree with the last thing that Brent said there about like the adaptability, the versatility. Like when I'm coaching a leader, I'm trying to make sure that they have, um, a, you know, a variety of tools in their t leadership toolkit because different situations are going to call for different behaviors. And so for somebody to say to me, well, that just doesn't vibe with my personality, you know, I'll say, well, that's too bad. You know, this, your, your people and your environment are going to require you to behave in some different ways. And you will diminish your effectiveness as a leader if you can't learn some of these new skills. So leadership coaching is about helping you add some skills, you know, to that toolkit, helping you read the room and know what people need. I think, you know, when you read the room today in a lot of industries, people are looking for transformational leaders and everyone uses that word pretty loosely. But, um, you know, in the literature, transformational leadership actually does um, involve four particular factors. And I think that these are the four factors that kind of resonate with me when I think about the kind of leader that I want to be, the kind of leader that um, I think that zillennials want to follow. I've got 20 something kids. And so I think about what are they looking for in their leaders and what kind of managers do I want to be shaping for the world that they're going to graduate and work in? So um, a coach-like approach to leading is, is really probably one of the things that I'm going to like be the biggest fan of because I think a coach-like leader is really empowering other people and saying, you know, you have the capacity, you've got the potential, let me develop you. Um, let's unleash your potential for this organization. And so as an organizational consultant, I can sometimes, you know, look at the big picture with my client, but then change has to happen at that individual level. And we know from the world of psychology that human behavior and change is really hard, but coaching is an effective tool to help bring about that change at that individual level. And you can't really mandate change from the top unless you've also got those frontline managers who know how to coach and bring people along with that vision. So I want to, if we can, kind of draw this line out a little bit further, because I, I like to think that sort of no one sets out to be a bad leader, uh, if we're going to sort of an ineffective leader, right? Um, but as you're talking about, there's sort of an individual component to this, and there's an organizational component to this. And so would love to just sort of unpack that a little bit of kind of what are organizations doing well, could be doing better in the leadership development cycle for individuals? And then we'll kind of follow up with sort of how individuals 
whether within or outside of organizational context, can sort of enhance their, their leadership effectiveness. Can I take a step back? Please. And not answer your question. And come back to you. <laughs> of course. So, um, I, it, maybe, maybe related to all of this, I, we keep using the word leadership. And you know, this is one of those great examples of you know, having an idea that you talk about in class a lot and then somebody else writes the paper that gets published that was like, but I've been talking about that forever and I didn't write it so I don't get any credit for it. Um, but you know, when I, I, I've had this amazing luxury through the course of my career and working with a lot of companies through my, my job here and through consulting and things along those lines. And, and having taught leadership for so long, you know, I, I get this, this great, you know, rich experience having so many people who are in leadership roles in my classes and talking to them about the challenges that they face. And to be honest with you, what I don't see in an organization, you know, is an absence of leadership. Right? What I see in organizations is an abdication of the most basic elements of management. Right? And, you know, I, I think we oftentimes mislead people and organizations and making them think that everybody has to be kind of whatever this pinnacle thing is of leadership, right? which I don't actually think that's the big problem that most organizations have. I think the basic tools that are in a manager's toolkit are things that people don't do very often. They don't do them consistently. They don't make them a part of their day-to-day -day job and their day-to-day -day activities. And as a function of that, organizations suffer, people suffer, engagement suffers, turnover rates are higher, commitments lower, you know, all of those, those, those things. So there's, there's a piece you know, around training people to be better leaders that's just getting them to do the simplest things, but to do the simplest things pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, that's not that challenging. So I, I kind of slightly disagree in the sense that I don't think that the biggest agenda, meaning where we have the biggest bang for our buck in terms of development, are the things that are terribly challenging. We just have to figure out a way to get people to do the simple things consistently because that's gonna have a massive impact. And I agree absolutely with, uh, with Ruth, that it's hard for me to define leadership or even to think about those basic activities without having, co having managers have this view that coaching is kind of part and parcel with what their responsibilities are. Because yeah, I, I, I agree with your point, not too many people wake up in the morning to figure out how they can go into the office and be a really bad leader that day. Like, I wanna figure out how I can, in a new and ingenious way, promote greater levels of disengagement you know, among my team. Yeah, how can I just instill that last little bit of conflict that I haven't been able to kind of you know, ring out everybody, right? They just go into the office and try to figure out how they can get the 18 million tasks that are on their plate done, but they forget about all the basic aspects of management. Can you double click on just like one or two examples of those basics that yeah. kind of are yeah. online? Well, I mean, think about, think about what we know about what employees tend to get really, really upset about, meaning the things that lead to disengagement and the things that lead to you know, uh, you know, challenges with commitments and, and the like, or the desire maybe to look for other organizations. Managers don't wake up in the morning and go in and say, when was the last time I had a career-related conversation with Scott about what his desires and aspirations are? And whether or not we as an organization are kind of helping him think that through and maybe taking the next step in, in that career. People don't go into the office and think about opportunities to provide feedback to somebody because they haven't done it in about two or three weeks or two or three months or two or three years. People don't go into the office thinking about how they can take one of the experiences that's right in front of them and use it as an opportunity to give someone else some insight in how to do something a little bit better and display interest in their personal development. You know, so much of development you know, is just basic grunt work, right? You know, it's, uh, you know, particularly from a manager standpoint, you know, it's saying, I've got this limited set of tools in my toolkit, you know, feedback and opportunity and my experiences that I can allocate to people in ways in which, you know, can, that, that can allow them to learn. But we race in and, you know, I know what your day's like, I know what my day's like, I know what probably your day's like. We race in and we just try to get all those things done and forget about the people that are there to help us get them done. Right? So if I could just like get people to do that, you know, very consistently, and not in a way that takes an enormous amount of time, I think we would solve a huge part of the problem you know, that people, people raise about leadership and, and, and management. That's helpful context. Um, Ruth, I'd be interested in sort of like, as you're talking about and thinking about leadership coaching, like you observed like any kind of gaps in individual motivations or kind of what are some of the things that are kind of keeping individuals from kind of crossing that threshold into to understanding kind of leadership through that kind of coaching lens? Um, I want to answer that question by connecting it to something that Brent, you know, also said, which is I think the way that we select 
and promote people into leadership is also broken. And so, you know, we look for certain traits in people, signs that they're ready for that next challenge, that next level of leadership. But we tend to have a bias for certain personality traits. And those personality traits do not always translate into leader effectiveness or good management skills. So just because somebody's outgoing and speaks up a lot in meetings and, you know, is extroverted and at the happy hours, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be effective in a role where they have to manage their peers if you elevate them. So when I'm coaching people who have been promoted to their first management role, there's, there's panic because they realize, like, I was a really strong individual contributor, but I'm being thrown into the deep end without this training, without coaching. And so, like you said, people don't wake up thinking, like, how can I be a terrible manager or leader today? I'd say maybe about, you know, one third of first time managers succeed because they've got the experience. They've got some, you know, skills to draw from two thirds, 60 some percent of first time managers fail in their first role. And it's for lack of training, um, sometimes for, you know, um, lack of support along the way. And I think coaching frontline managers has got to be an investment for every organization. If you want to have a strong leadership pipeline, you've got to start addressing it, you know, with those early career people. You can't really wait until they're in their 40s in their first senior role to give them an executive coach. And so there's a very strong tilt um, towards giving resources to people at the top of an organization when really your investment needs to be kind of at the base of the pyramid, of the organizational pyramid. Is there anything else that organizations are doing well in terms of that early identification of leadership and sort of getting ahead of that versus sort of putting it off? Um, I, I think one of the things that I think a sign of a healthy organization and an organization that's, that's going to have a strong pipeline is internal leader development programs. I think when you depend too much on external consultancies, you get kind of this scattershot approach. Um, if you can build something internal that's contextual, that's giving them the competencies that you know leaders in your organization need to advance and succeed, um, those are the those are the organizations that are going to have sustainable you know, um, plans for the future. You know, I, I would say, I, I did, using the term organizations, I would say the organizations that seem to, in my view, get this right are organizations that kind of build a culture that supports the notion of succession planning from the top to the bottom of the organization. You know, where it's not something that is an activity that is restricted to the top couple of layers where they're really thinking about how to allocate developmental assignments in a way that will round people out to take on the next big job. But it's it's something that's an ethic that's almost built into the way they think about talent all the way through the organization. And they try to try to really build into their leadership and their, and their managers this idea that your job is to figure out how to cultivate the next generation of people that's going to take on your role. And they incentivize right? You know, their managers to be, be thinking about and to be developing that talent so that you know, when they step into their next role, that they have someone who can just easily backfill in. And, and that, that idea that culturally, you know, a focus on succession from top to the bottom is something that I think creates the fertile ground. I, I completely agree, you know, with, uh, with Ruth that, you know, organizations, you know, probably shouldn't say this out loud, given my role, um, actually only part of my role. Uh, and, you know, I, I taught a program today where people from multiple multiple organizations could come to it, so it wasn't like contextual, I guess, completely. Um, but it is always better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but I do think, but absolutely. I mean, leadership development has to be kind of framed within the context of the organization that you're developing those leaders in. Uh, it, it's not a generic process, and. Uh, I, I think anytime you can be very bespoke, you know, in the process of identifying the challenges that the organization faces that the leaders need to be able to address and kind of the culture of the organization that you need to continuously promote through the development of leaders, you're always much better. Hmm. I want to kind of pivot a little bit and kind of fold in this ingredient of zillennials into the conversation and kind of define what that means and sort of how this kind of upcoming kind of this next wave of generational leaders is 
kind of shifting and changing sort of the thought process and some of the new challenges that that might be introducing, opportunities that that's presenting, and sort of start to talk a bit about kind of what that, uh, what, you, what you're both observing in that space. Where should we start? <laughs> Ruth and I are gonna disagree about this, by the way. Where gonna, should we start? Um, so, you know, Based on my experience with, you know, working with undergrads here at Rice and then having two kids who, let's see, I've got three kids, 19, 23, 25, they're smack in that zillennial demographic. And so when I say zillennial, I'm talking about like 18 to 30 year olds. So the baby millennials and then that first, you know, um, cohort of Gen Z that is now in the workplace. I think they are distinct. I think they are different. There's something about having grown up with technology. Their world is a lot bigger. They've been exposed to a lot more ideas. Their, um, their approach, their philosophy, philosophy around building their careers is very different. You know, I'm Gen X. We graduated. We put on our suits. We went to work and did what our bosses told us to do. And we were good little soldiers for a long time because we wanted a promotion. Zillennials aren't like that. If you work with the Zillennials, you know that they've got a lot of attitude. They've got a lot of confidence in themselves. They're planning to job hop after nine months. They're going to ask you for a raise and a promotion after they've been there for six months. Um, there's a restlessness to them. Um, there's a boldness there. And it's making management a kind of tricky for a lot of people. Um, and so what I'm seeing is sort of this, um, I would say that the boomers were the builders, Gen X, we were the maintainers, the uh, millennials were kind of dissenters. They grumbled about, you know, corporate structures and traditions, but they kind of basically signed up and went along. Your Gen Z, they are the disruptors. They want to do everything differently. They will challenge your processes on day one. Maybe they'll hang out for a week before they challenge your processes, but they will challenge your processes. And so they're really relationally um, motivated, though. And so when people say, like, I don't know how to manage them, like, you've got to treat them like people. They are not, they're not cogs in a machine. They want to be treated like people. And so transactional leadership isn't, isn't going to, you know, motivate them, retain them. I think you're lucky right now if you, if you can hold on to a Gen Z for 18 months to two years, you're pretty lucky. But that makes succession planning very complicated for a lot of organizations. So, so there's a lot of heads nodding in the audience. You said up front that you disagree. And so I uh, would love to, to hear your perspective on the topic. I will take on every head nod. <laughs> um, how much time can I have? <laughs> so, Two, three minutes. <laughs> crap. Um, so where to, where to, where to start? Where to start? I, I would see there. Okay, so there. Let, let's start with research, and then can it, we'll take it into kind of the broader the broader context a little bit. Um, my my concern is is a couple of fold. One is, yeah, I'm 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 pretty old. Yeah, I've had the opportunity to kind of live through kind of successive generations that people talk about, you know, in the popular literature. The problem is how we talk about generations tends to be very inconsistent with what the research shows us about generational differences, right? And it's not easy research to do because it, you, you have this, this problem of conflating, um, you know, the stage of life a person is in, you know, which does actually quite naturally lead to kind of differences in expectations with actual generational differences that are based on maybe kind of these collective experiences that, that, that groups have. And it's not easy to tease, tease those kinds of things apart. Um, I've got a colleague uh, who, a couple of colleagues actually, who you know, did some research where they were able to actually tease that stuff apart. And that research, consistent with a lot of other research on generational differences, basically shows that our assumptions about the existence of those differences is not consistent with what we actually find. In fact, we tend to find that the generations are substantially more similar in what they value out of work and what they want out of work. You know, than our perception of them would be. More importantly, and this is actually much more important for me, is that when you look within a generational band, there is huge variation across that band right? and, you know, in what they want and desire out of work. So, so calling a generation a homogenous group where everyone believes the same thing, I think is completely inconsistent with what the research shows. Right? Secondly, 
and, and this is where I think things from an organizational standpoint get, get important. When we stereotype a generation by saying that the generation wants this, the generation has this challenges, the generation has this demands, we actually, and, and we create or we reify this view, we actually create a situation where organizations start to treat that generation as if those things are true and real. And they get very much back the same kind of behavior that they expect based on the treatment that they receive. It's the same concept of a, as, a, as, a, as a stereotype. When I, when I treat someone in a stereotyped way, I tend to get behavior that's more consistent with the stereotype right back. And I think there's some reasonable evidence suggesting that's exactly what we're doing in, in many organizations. So many of the things that have affected, I'm probably past my three minutes, sorry, um, you know, that have affected you know, younger generations you know, have affected old, older generations too. Now, there is something that, that I think Ruth highlighted that, it's, that is important, but I don't think it's a generational issue. And that is, we have kind of changed the game, right, you know, over time for employees that are slightly younger than me, although it affects me too. Um, and that is, we shifted the relationship between employees and companies, and we did so in a massively dramatic fashion. The knock-on effects of that has created a really, really dysfunctional environment, you know, for people that are at the early stages of their career. Right. So back in the day, people have talked, you know, heard me talk about this before, but back in the day when job security was the name of the game, that organizations conferred job security to people and it was built on an assumption that those people were going to give security back and, and or give loyalty back to the organization, that that was this foundation of what we used to call the, psycho or what we call the psychological contract that explains that set of responsibilities between employees and companies. When we got rid of that, because organizations started focusing on efficiency and downsizing and everything, well, it got replaced you know, with this idea that organizations do owe me something. It's not job security. What do they owe me? Well, they owe me a focus on me, my development, my career, my growth, you know, in ways that's going to help me create a sense of career security. Right? Because I'll work for you as an organization if you show me that you're going to help build a sense of security that I'm going to have the career that I want in the long term because you're probably not guaranteeing me a job. And one of the things we found, it was a fantastic you know, researcher at Wharton who's, who's done this, this, this study, is that turnover rates have consistently increased in organizations over the last 20 or 30 years to the point where recruiters believe it's much better to replace people who are leaving with external hires, which creates this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy right, of, of churn. Right? How do I improve my career? I go to work for some other organization because that other organization is going to see me as already being trained by this one. I jump ship. I'm going to get a you know increased pay rate. I'm going to get a pay raise. You know, maybe a promotion. But we promote that ethic, right? So early stage career people are kind of walking into an environment where they recognize that because of how we've changed the world, you know, that this is the best cycle to kind of improve their career outcomes. Mm. So it's kind of like the causality or kind of how we attribute sort of the the features that we're talking about in, in kind of this 18 to 30 year old band um, is uh, helpful to think about as we kind of diagnose and talk about sort of how does, how does one lead or manage work with, what are of effective ways to sort of work with this band of employees as they start to kind of work their way through the workforce would be, um, would love to sort of get some perspective, uh, Ruth and Brent, about you know. the. I mean the, I, the 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 work from consulting firms that I actually am willing to accept, right? You know, is um, every almost every every piece that gets published, you know, over the last you know, 10, 15 years it has really highlighted the idea that if you want to enhance the commitment of employees you need to demonstrate an interest in their, their career development, you know, their growth, their personal development, their learning. And that actually actually you know, kicked into really high gear during the kind of COVID period. In fact, you, you started to see in a study after study showing that during the Great Resignation that you know, one of the big explanations wasn't just what we thought it was, but it was also the fact that organizations weren't paying attention to you know, how, how this was going to affect their careers and having conversations with people over and over again. So, yeah, I think the solution is probably the solution that we've always known, you know, which is to dive right back into being really good and sophisticated into talking to people about, you know, what do they what do they want? You know, what do they want out of their employment with you know us as an organization? How do they see their careers progressing? And demonstrating what we can do with the resources that are available to us to help them grow the capabilities that will allow them to hopefully take those steps, you know, when and if they become available in the organization. Just get back to that stuff. Ruth, what are your thoughts? 
I kind of lost the plot. <laughs> let me let me pull it back around because I'm I want to ask because it's this uh, it's this idea of like okay we understand kind of what what's what's the attributions of the causality of kind of why employees today are sort of behaving the way that they are because I, I think we all see kind of the 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 information in front of us. I think it's clear that maybe attributing that to uh, a, a generational birth year might not sort of make sense that there are other things sort of at play, which I like. And this idea that like the pandemic is sort of well, like, I was going to say unmasked. That was a, maybe a, a, a bad way to say it, but sort of like, uh, you know, revealed kind of a, maybe a, a deeper seated issue, maybe accelerated some things. And, you know, so what I want to do sort of as we kind of start to land the plane on kind of the, the, the end of the discussion is, and there's some hazard in doing this, but I, I want to like, what are like, I'm trying to get to like tactical, actionable kinds of things, some takeaways. And, and so I, I, I want to sort of talk about this, how people are integrating leadership coaching into kind of their day to day. Like, what are some tips or advice or things to bring leadership coaching into kind of a tangible, I show up at work tomorrow. I can kind of go do these kinds of things. I know it's a terrible question, but I want to get it like tactical, like some. I, I, I like it. I like it. So, I mean, I think leadership coaching is built on like several, several things, right? Like empathy and human connection, um, authenticity, vulnerability, intellectual humility. Like if you can embody a coach like approach as a leader and bring those things to work, you're going to inspire people. You're going to connect with people. That is what zillennials are looking for. Like, show me that you're a human, that, you know, that I can go to work and be, be fully human also. I think the pandemic did accelerate some of these changes. Um, the zillennials were already kind of living in under this cloud of existential angst, right? They've grown up with school shooter drills, active shooter drills, climate change disasters, terrorism, 9-11, you name it, pandemics are like, they live under this like very dark dystopian cloud. And to the, to a lot of zillennials that I coach and talk to, they're like, do I have to really go to work and do this for the next 40 years? I mean, can I just run away and join a cult? It's, it, there's a, this existential angst. And so the antidote to that is let them be fully human at work. You know, show some empathy as a leader, acknowledge them, acknowledge their challenges and their tribulations, even if they seem like petty dramas to you. You know, people feel things more intensely when they're in their 20s. We do have research around that. So I think bringing your empathy to work, um, being fully human, connecting with them, you know, at that personal level, that is probably the number one retention strategy that I'm telling my clients is you, you've got to think about how you're showing up at work, and can you can you co can you regulate yourself so that your employees can co-regulate in your presence? You know, people are living under a lot of stress. There's a lot of burnout right now. So treating your employees like humans—that's a it's a good piece of advice. <laughs> I love it, Brent. Any any advice or things that you kind of Go to. I know. I'm certain you get asked advice a lot on on this topic. And so, what's uh, what's kind of some of your favorite actionable things to kind of go and do and start to chip away at this? Yeah, I do. You know, I, I again, I, I I think about it as a broader problem, but I agree with Ruth that if there if there is a if there's been a positive outcome in the world of work for the pandemic, I think it what it what it maybe has been is creating an environment where there's less stigma attached to work workplace well-being issues, where there's a forum now where people can have a conversation that's meaningful about the amount of stress that they're experiencing, how job demands can be extraordinarily excessive, the compromises that job demands create, you know, and all of those kinds of things. So I, I do think there is this, this domain, and, and it's not just younger generations, it's older generations as well, you know, that, that have the same, the same well-being problem, that, that as leaders, we can promote the conversation and deliver the support that is that is necessary to get people to, you know, to, to maybe be to maybe mitigate some of the negative effects, you know, of the excessive job demands that are created in an environment where people are operating in a really lean situation. 
the coaching part of it, you know, if I if I had my magic wand, you know, that I could wave um, and and get people, you know, I, I didn't really mention this like for for about twelve years, you know, I taught a, I taught a course that was really designed to train managers to be better coaches in executive education here, and um, you know, kind of my punchline to that whole thing was. At the end of the day, being a great coach is making sure that you're putting on those lenses every day when you walk in yeah, and that you're looking for opportunities to help your employees enhance their capabilities in ways that are going to allow them to succeed in the job that they're in and hopefully in the next job that you're already talking to them about. Right? And so long as you kind of wake up and realize that, yeah, I've got a lot of things that I have to do. My boss has high expectations for me, but you kind of have to make sure that you wear in the coaching lenses first, you know, and then maybe all the task lenses second. You know, that it'll it'll prompt you to help ensure that you're building that relationship with your employees that will ensure their engagement, ensure their success, and help you get all that stuff done. So I, I kind of like to think of coaching as just a perspective, you know, that then translates into a lot of activities, you know, that can really help engage and get a committed workforce that's going to help support you achieving your own goals. I want to kind of pull on a, a, a thread, which uh, Ruthie kind of touched on a little bit, which is this, um, it seems like we're in kind of these early post-pandemic innings and talking about like there's, I'm not a researcher, I read a book one time about like generational research, which was like the, these lines of demarcation uh, for generations are often made by experiencing fear and like being in a place. So like 9-11, as you, as you mentioned, is an example. If you can remember sort of 9-11 is like one of the earliest kind of ideas or thoughts of kind of feeling that fear. And that what, what that can mean is there's like kind of micro generations that there's like a, a political uprising in a particular geography or whatever. And so coming out of the pandemic with the, with sort of the technological connectivity and the worldwide nature of it is we've actually are just coming out of the most sort of comprehensive generational marker ever in human history. And so we're kind of in this like this, the fuse is lit. There's kind of this experiment that's sort of now gonna happen. And so this is kind of a crystal ball question of sort of like looking ahead to the future. Like we're starting to see these kind of early indications that there's a discontinuity, some kind of inflection point in the space that we're talking about. Where do you speculate that that's going to take us? Either one, please. I, I think where it's going to take us is I think people are going to have this new appreciation for this one precious life that they have. Like, oh, my God, we survived. We made it. Um, we're, we're still alive and we're still here today. So how do I want to live my life? And what doesn't matter if you're a 21 year old, 51 year old, you're, you're just looking at life and having this appreciation for it and also feeling a responsibility to live well. So, you know, I think that, you know, if you are a leader, think about your responsibilities to the people that you lead, like, and how can you contribute to their flourishing? because they're coming to work every day and putting themselves under your leadership, which means you have a responsibility to help them flourish there. And so, um, I mean, that's something that I think about. I also think about for, you know, people in the zillennial bracket, they're going to have um, this like thirst for life, I think. Like they're gonna wanna taste everything on the smorgasbord of life because, um, Life is short. You don't know when the next pandemic might hit. You don't know when the next earthquake might hit. So more risk taking, more career hopping, uh, more appetite for adventure and trying new things. And so I fully expect that, you know, the 20 somethings in my life are going to have probably five to seven careers in their lifetime. And I don't see any of them hanging around one organization, you know, for a gold watch. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really reluctant to prognosticate. Every time I've tried, I've failed. I've always been wrong. Right? So I, I will preface whatever I say by saying that. I'm just probably likely wrong. Um, I, I don't know. You know, I, 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 as I've been asked this question over and over again, 
you know, at different phases of going through the pandemic, I think my attitude about it has changed. You know, I, I, I do believe, and, I, and I'm willing to say I do believe fundamentally that the future probably will require from employers and certainly from managers a, a greater tolerance for flexibility in how we do work and where we do work. Right. Um, I do think that's probably you know a fundamental shift that's happened in organizations, and we're going to have to figure out how to adapt all of our kind of management-related tools to an environment where the proportion of people who are coming into an office versus working somewhere else is different than what that proportion looked like in the past. And that actually proposes that 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 just creates a lot of challenges that we are yet to have the greatest answers to. Right? You know, how do you onboard someone who you don't see very frequently right? or ever in the office? How do you manage culture and maintain culture and create consistencies in employee experience when people are bouncing back and forth here and there? You know, how do you how do you do performance management? You know, in a context where I don't actually ever get to see somebody, or I see somebody very kind of like episodically and you know and, and intermittently, so to speak. We don't have good answers to all that stuff, right? So because of maybe this demand for flexibility that will lead to this kind of change in how we do a bit of work, we're going to have to go back and maybe do a whole lot of research and kind of rewrite some of the, the guidelines, you know, and how, how you approach those, those, those issues. So I think that's, that's kind of a big thing that's out there. Um, beyond that, I, I've got to be honest with you, we're not that dynamic of a species, right? I mean, this is like a moment in time. There have been a lot of moments in time like this, and we tend to go right back right, to the old ways of doing things. So I, I, you know, I think the jury's still a little bit out on most of the big things, right? And you know, my experience in the organizations that I'm working with right now is that there's a pretty strong demand to get things kind of normalized a little bit, you know, with just a few changes in the basic assumptions. We're a group living animal. We have always been one. We always exist in status hierarchies, right? That's how we organize ourselves effectively. Uh, that's not going to change. So we built organizations around the presumption that's consistent with how we organize ourselves. So how, how new and different will it be 10 years from now? I'm not really sure. I, don't, I, I, I think a pretty strong argument could be made that it might go right back to the way it was. <laughs> awesome. Ruth, Brent, thank you so much for being on the show today. This has been awesome. And thank you for bringing your talents and passions to Rice Business and the leadership development opportunities here for students. This has been fantastic. It's been great, Sam. And we are going to open it up. We've got 15 minutes of audience Q&A. We're going to bring a microphone up here and uh, would encourage you to come and, uh, and ask your questions into the mic so we can capture it for posterity. Hi. So thank you both for speaking. Um, right from the very start, when you both started talking about topics like leadership as an identity and contingent and based on your actions combined with your shared emphasis on the need to develop leadership you know lower down in the organization with the younger more junior employees um, it put me to thinking immediately about the concept of influence so you know leadership without that legitimacy authority and I wanted to get your thoughts on number one, if leadership isn't so tied to your hierarchical position, then first of all, what is the actual difference between leadership and influence, if any? And two, if we agree with everything that we've said, and I think we do, um, what would you say are the most important takeaways that we can have as leaders for recognizing and developing influence in those more junior employees to help bring them up into the company's succession? I know that was a very long question that's complicated. I'm sorry. Requires a very, very long answer. Yeah. <laughs> Do you got a 30-second version? Um, I would say yes to all of the above. Um, yeah. You can walk into any middle school cafeteria and figure out who has influence, right? And it's not necessarily the student council president that has a title or a captain of a football team. You can see in a 
any group of, you know, human beings who has the influence and who's going to be the de facto leader, you know, when the need arises. So I think being able to help people see them, you know, develop that leader identity um, apart from a role or a title or a position is really important. Um, I think, you know, helping people find their voice, understand their values, um, living those out, that's that's really, I think, the, the heart of leadership. And there's something authentic and attractive about that that people are drawn to. And when you turn around and people are following you, that's when you know you're a leader. Um, maybe, maybe one way of thinking about it is that you can think about you know, influence as an act and you can think about influence as an attribute, right? You know, that you know, I, based on a variety of things, maybe a lot of it being built around my social capital that I've developed over time in the organization, you know, I have a lot of kind of natural influence that's built around that. And you know, generating that kind of influence through social capital is really a function of recognizing the relational component you know, to, what, to what influence is, building the relationships, establishing the relationships, creating relationships in a way that allows me to broker resources and kind of maybe broker other people's capital when I need it, and that's a very strong component of it. You know, influence is an act. You know, we've spent years and years and years and years studying that phenomenon and helping people understand that to influence others is not a common set of stra- I mean, It's not one thing. You know, it's the recognition that not everyone is going to be influenced by the same strategy and making sure you have an understanding of what all the strategies are, right, you know, so that you can employ them when they're needed. Uh, and you know, I think you have to think about it differently and which side you're, you're on. Right? Thank you, Thank you. Amy. Hi. Let's get a little tactical for a moment. You both alluded to, and I'm thinking specifically of middle managers and, and line managers um, being thinly staffed. And of course, we all know that over the past, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years, organizations have gotten leaner and leaner. And managers are rewarded on their task output, not their leadership output. And it's time consuming, the amount of time it takes to have authentic and meaningful conversations about not only the employee's task, but their growth, et cetera, uh, can take a considerable amount of a manager's time. And they're not necessarily rewarded for those activities. At a basic level, when you go into an organization to suggest additional leadership coaching, how do you quantify the value of those activities? I, oh, this was, I thought you were going in an entirely different direction with that question. Like that was like a curveball at the, at the very end, right? <laughs> like honestly, I have to ask, answer the first part. <laughs> I actually think it's a bit of a myth, you know, that coaching takes a lot of time, right? I, don't give me that reaction. <laughs> Organization. <laughs> so I will I will tell you very quickly a conversation that happened in class today, um, and I and I have to I have to give credit where credit is due. The person who kind of taught me a lot about all of this is a guy named David Peterson, who was a, a person who got really well known in coaching early on. He got his PhD just a few years before me, but in counseling psychology and minds and organizational psychology. And 25 years ago, I flew him into Cornell to teach a class on coaching to my MBA students because he was already really well known as a coach and I was just trying to figure out what this whole thing was all about. And one of the students in the class kind of at the very end raised his hand and said, David, you know, um, this has been really interesting, but uh, maybe you don't understand what my job is like because my job takes about 99% of my time and now you're telling me I have to coach my employees, you know, but like, seriously, come on. And David gave the best answer to that question I've ever heard, and it has stuck with me for a quarter century. And it's kind of how I built my leaders coach class, you know, so many years ago. The the what what David said was, you might kind of miss the point a little bit because coaching isn't the hour meeting that you schedule with an employee once a week to deliver a little bit of coaching. You know, coaching is how you utilize the natural flow of your work-related experiences to give other people insights and opportunities to learn and opportunities to develop and opportunities to grow. Because right in front of you, every single day, as a line manager, you are doing tons of things, all of those tasks. What you have to figure out is which one of those tasks are really developmental opportunities for other people and how you can involve them in that in ways that show them how to do something that you're going to want them to do in the future that can maybe even give them an opportunity to actually do it you know, with your supervision. You know, that can just expose them and demystify something for them that they might not have had any real insight into. And when you're using the natural flow of your own experiences, it doesn't take a lot of time. You're going to do the work anyway. Just bring them into the whole conversation. Show them what it looks like. You know, give them that, that toolkit. The upfront cost 
is asking questions of people about what their career-related expectations are. But you can't manage people without having answers to those questions, right? That's just kind of a baseline. So once you get past that, I, I really don't think, you know, if you're doing coaching the right way, providing the feedback at the right time, sharing experiences and utilizing experiences, it has to be that big of a drain. You're just doing it in the context or course of your normal day. Right? Um, in the U.S., in general, coaching is uh, regarded as a good way of, you know, or a way to elevate your performance. But in some cultures, it's still seen as remedial. So in a global organization, how do you help um, these other cultures understand when you're giving them this opportunity of an executive coach, it's to up-level their skills and not remedial? That's a great question. I'd say that, you know, 20, 30 years ago here in the U.S., it was considered remedial also. It, what, what kind of turned the tide was just the flood of senior lead, the flood of coaching at the senior leader level, right, where it became seen as a privilege and a perk. And this is an investment from the company because we value you so much and we want to retain you. So you have to start giving coaching and you know, providing coaching to those high performers, to those valued employees, so that it takes away the stigma of this being something for the problem people. Yeah, I would, you know, A, the, the more senior leaders can celebrate the fact that they themselves, you know, are benefiting from coaching, the more it, it actually creates a culture where it's much more kind of amenable to everybody getting on board. But I think just kind of communicating the message, right? So you know, there are so many different contexts in which coaching is really, really, really valuable. One is actually elevating performance, right? You know, that, that, that is a fantastic, you know, kind of a context in which coaching can be valuable. But there are others that are equally valuable, like helping people adapt to change, right? Whenever your organization implements, you know, significant, you know, change, enterprise-wide change, you know there are going to be a lot of people who are uncomfortable, who are concerned about their competence and capability, who, you know, might just, because of their personalities, be a little bit resistant to doing new and different. And it's a great context where coaching can actually get people over that particular hump. One that's also really important is taking people who are kind of fantastically capable, really great contributors, high potentials, and rapidly accelerating their development so that they can take on that much bigger role. And when you can celebrate examples of all of those, it kind of destigmatizes, you know, the fact that they're, that it's always about, you know, underperformance and that you've been identified or you've been kind of tapped only because you're not, you're not hitting your standards. Hey, thanks for all three of you guys being here tonight. It was really enjoyable. Um, Brent, you talked about succession planning from the C-suite to individual contributors. And then you said, and you have to incentivize it. How do you incentivize it? Oh, so the very best organizations, you know, I think, are organizations that build directly into the performance management process some kind of evaluation of the extent to which managers are meeting human capital goals, right? You know, and a part of that is ask, asking employees of that manager, you know, is your boss having conversations with you about whether you're, you know, what your career is going to go? Is your boss actually demonstrating an interest? You know, in, uh, yeah, in, in your development, are they allocating resources, you know, in ways that will actually give you that chance to develop? We know those things are directly related to engagement. We get that data off of employee engagement surveys all the time. And, you know, build it into the performance management process so people are being held accountable not just for results and outcomes. They're being held accountable for the things that are going to contribute to the achievement of those results and outcomes, which are all these human capital metrics that aren't that hard to measure. Right. There are organizations, by the way, that do this, you know, and they, they do it in a pretty sophisticated way, and they actually build a component of a manager's incentive compensation around those very factors. And those are the organizations that are really trying to take it to a cultural level. You know, this is what we expect out of managers. We expect this to be the experience that employees have. Thank you. So grateful for all the insights and what you've had to share, but all have you know that we might have to consider the redefinition of the organization. Because in the 60s here in Houston, we were working on getting a man on the moon. And now that we're in the 21st century, we're talking about a dystopian cloud. We're talking about a pandemic. We're talking about a food, water, energy, and health crisis. So to me, from a leadership perspective, you keep talking about an organization as if that organization is the organization from the industrial age to present day. And then you were talking about where could we see ourselves in 10 or 20 years. So 
from a leadership perspective, shouldn't the organizations be thinking outside of their four walls? I mean, we've already created this hybrid workforce because we have to solve some of these seemingly impossible challenges because now Houston wants to be the leader for the energy transition. And they're also building out this massive incubation and they're trying to catalyze capital. Shouldn't, shouldn't we be thinking of leadership on how we're preparing an individual that could be job hopping from a career perspective to already span organizations and being prepared as the organization we think traditional to the organization we're growing into that I gotta hand these employees off and that as an organization I need to think of this as an ecosystem and how do I then educate and coach for people to be in this ecosystem so we can solve these challenges that we are facing. No, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's way too hard. <laughs> Wait, <I> mean, <laughs> leading question. Um, there's, there's so many things that I think we could add to that, right? You know, in ways that would shape the possibilities for what leadership could look like in the future. I've got a, a former colleague who, uh, you and I are on faculty together at Cornell, and then he went to USC and he just recently retired. He's done like some really interesting work on how the very unit around which we organ we create organizations, a job, you know, has changed pretty fundamentally and has made arguments about the future of what you know, quote unquote jobs are, um, with with substantially less defined and more ambiguous kind of responsibilities and what the implications are for organizing, for performance management, for leadership, for all of those things. And although it's a more micro level view of what you're talking about, you know, it has a similar kind of effect. Right? It, it means, you know, leaders have to be even better, you know, at continuously establishing expectations in ambiguous situations for what they need out of people in that particular moment and figuring out how over time, whatever that time period is, they can aggregate that, that set of expectations that they've created for people into something that's kind of meaningful, you know, that can lead to how we define success, that can lead to how we choose to promote or not promote, to how we compensate or not compensate, right? And I, I, mean, I have no answers to those questions, right? Um, but I think there's, an oper there's, a, there's like just this very fertile bed for interesting research you know, that can help us think it, think it through. I love how you took us in this very like inspirational, big direction because that that should that should be what leadership does it should inspire us to tackle the biggest problems out there every problem on this globe you know could be solved if we had the right kind of leadership and you know alignment and resources um i want to point out over here there's a little cluster of students that graduated from the mba program a few years ago they they were coached they learned a lot about leadership coaching. They saw a problem here in Houston with refugees um, coming in and not being prepared for the school system. They started a nonprofit. And I mean, two years in, they, they, are, they are recruiting coaches. They're changing the lives of, you know, immigrants um, just right here in S Southwest Houston. And so, like, I love how you're telling us, like, leadership isn't about, it's not trapped in an organization. It's not about it's not limited to succession and titles. It's being able to take those abilities and have that vision and tackle those big problems. Love it, great conversation. Thank you so much for everyone for bringing your questions. A um, Couple of quick closing comments for those in the room that might have admissions or recruiting questions. Steve Summers here in the back will be here throughout the reception and so would encourage you to corner him. And then just a quick comment of gratitude to Katery and Ananya here, who helped coordinate and organize the event. And again, a big thank you, Ruth and Brent, for being here. This has been a privilege. Thank you so much. And again, reception out here in the rotunda. Hang around for a little bit. Keep the questions coming. And uh, certainly go subscribe. To I'll have you know, go check out the episodes, share it with friends, family, prospective students, and the like. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening. 
This has been I'll Have You Know, a production of Rice Business. You can find more information about our guests, hosts, and announcements on our website, business.rice.edu. Please subscribe and leave a rating wherever you find your favorite podcasts. We'd love to hear what you think. The hosts of I'll Have You Know are myself, Scott Gale, and Maya Pomeroy.